Jeremy. Jeremy.net. I am a comic book artist, writer, creator, and I share my creative process here with you online. If you'd like to support this channel, get additional bonus videos and behind-the-scenes content before anyone else, go to patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. Subscribe to my Patreon. If you would like to see the best of my social media posts from Twitter and Instagram online, keep up with all the other things I'm working on throughout the month when I'm not online, when I'm not live streaming, you can sign up for my newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net. And if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my comics, or if you read on Amazon Kindle or on Comixology, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. That will forward you to my Amazon author page. So, first off, I apologize if there's anything weird. Or First off, I apologize for the late start. I had a bunch of technical difficulties getting started today. For some reason, my mouse just decided to go nuts. In fact, I need to remember to leave it plugged in because I was charging it right before it went nuts. Um, that said, also, once I restarted my computer, because, you know, that's the first thing you do when you have technical difficulties is restart. After restarting my computer, then it seemed like my internet connection was going really slow and really choppy. So I don't know if the audio is coming in weird, if the video is coming in weird or choppy. If it is, I apologize for it. I'm not sure why this is happening. Um, I see Hyena in the chat. Hyena Vaughn, how you doing, man? Thanks for popping in. Yeah, hopefully things are relatively smooth from here on out. We'll see. I've had a bunch of ups and downs with my computer this morning. So, getting started. I do have the most recent page from Morningstar set up. Oh! Folks already popping in from the chat. I see Amar is in here, and uh, my jo my buddy John Ersick in the chat. He says, the audio video looks good. Thank you. Colorist, artist, comic creator extraordinaire, John Ersick's here. Always good to have him on. So <clears throat> before we get into some comic book work, um, as Hyena reminded me, we had discussed the idea of me doing some pixel art. So... I downloaded a pixel art brush. Let me get some shout outs. Um, first, the YouTube channel Ghost Paper. Ghost Paper. I went to him and watched his tutorial on, uh, on pixel brushes and canvas size so I could figure out what size to set up some artwork um, before I started. Because otherwise, you'd be sitting here watching me for an hour just messing with preferences till I found something right. So I watched his tutorial. There's a link to it in the description on the YouTube video. And then also a shout out to uh, Bardo Brushes. I downloaded um, some of her brushes because the other half of um, Ghost Paper, <laughs> I see King Crows in the chat, says ka ka, oh boy folks. Thanks for popping in. The other parts of the um, the tutorial that, uh, that Ghost Paper had was on actually creating pixel brushes. And as I started to look into it, I thought, yeah, it's not incredibly difficult. It's good that he shows you how to do it. But I wanted to be able to just get in, draw, show some pixel art, and then move on. So as you see here, this was the first test that I did real quick. So I cheated a little bit. because I kind of said I was just going to, to sit here and, and fumble around in front of you guys. But I decided to, well, let me turn that back on. I did a quick sketch of uh, Lucifer from Morningstar as a, as a pixel art piece. But let's see here. I'm trying to decide what I want to draw. Maybe Isbaal, Queen of the Demons. I'll do a, a quick pixel art piece of her. Well, you know, she doesn't really have a lot of color on her. Don't care. That's what I'm going to do. Um, let's see. Amar says, I finished my first sketch paint series for the new workflow I'm working uh, working on for comics and animation. That's awesome. You know, every time you can, can hit a milestone, get some stuff done, I always find that that is... Very inspiring, because it keeps you going. You know, this, this comic creating stuff is a very long, arduous process, and it's good to, um, you know, to be able to to break through. To, to Every time you can check something off the list, you're like, all right, I'm moving the ball on the field. Because really, making comics is a bunch of little steps that you have to go through to get to the, uh, the big goal at the end. So I'm not going to be doing pixel art this whole, uh, this whole stream. I'm just going to do one quick sketch in pixel art, and uh, and then we'll we'll hop back to Morningstar, unless you guys really want to see more stuff. But in in dabbling with this, the thing I found 
is that it's not any different really than the art that I already make. It's just at a lower resolution. So if I'm doing Isba all, let's say I'm gonna do a bust of her. Really, so here's just my, my basic pixel brush. I've got it set down to one pixel, but I have to draw very lightly. If I put any pressure down at all, it gives me a line like two pixels wide. So really I would start out with sort of blocking in, haha, because it's all pixels, just blocking in my head. I think I'm gonna have her at kind of a three quarters leaning out snarling. So blocking in her head, blocking in her neck. So that's, that's her neck. And then here's her shoulders. And I'm not gonna draw her hair in yet because her hair is gonna be all wild and, and flowy and it's gonna end up, I would lose it in the pixels if I were to draw her hair in. Like I would lose it until I get the chance to, to put in the basic structure of her head because the way she's designed as a character, it's like she's got a mouth and teeth coming out of this big mass of, of flowing hair. Let's see. In terms of the underpaintings, uh, let's see. Amar says it was a portrait painting series where there were no underdrawings. They came out nice. It's moving on to landscapes. You know, I wish I had time to do more uh, more landscape pieces because I feel like it would help me improving my environment drawing for uh, for comics, my environment drawing and painting. So plain air and landscapes are something I want to uh, spend more time doing. I think a lot of people forget that part of your ongoing development as an artist is continually practicing and, and trying out new skills, trying out things that you haven't done before, things you want to get better at. And I personally don't feel like I get to spend as much time as I'd like to doing that. Um, Pterodactyl says hello to everyone. Um, how's everyone doing today? Uh, I am, well, now that I finally got my, my stream up and running, I'm feeling much better. I was very afraid that this was going to be a repeat of the, the stream I had a couple weeks ago where no matter what I did, it was not going to let me work. And I was going to have to just, I don't know, end up recording a separate stream and uploading, like recording a, a separate video and uploading it as being able to stream live. Sometimes that happens. So I'm going to just give Isba all, damn it, going too heavy with this brush. Let me see if I can bring this down. I've already got the pixel size at one. Her eyes look like uh, <laughs> exclamation marks. be very delicate here actually let me see out of this brush pack is there a brush that's oh the single pixel stamp let me try that that's a little bit better whoops I still have to kind of be delicate with this but yeah I really found that doing pixel art is not particularly different than doing any other traditional art. You figure out what you want, you, you block in your figures. And um, yeah, for me, it just feels like another form of drawing. You know, when you guys were asking about doing pixel art last week, I mean, was there something particular that you guys had in mind that you wanted to see or questions, things you wanted me to explore? Because I've never done this before. And now that I'm doing it, I'm like, yeah, it just, to me, drawing is drawing. Um, so doing this pixel art, it just feels like I'm drawing, um, it feels like drawing with a Sharpie, which, you know, I've done doing uh, convention sketches, which I generally don't recommend with Sharpie because they don't, uh, you know, they're not color fast. But um, I don't know. I mean, I was curious. I'm actually curious with you guys what it was you wanted to see when you said, hey, make some pixel art because it isn't something I normally do. And I will tell you that now that I've done it, I don't dismiss it. I don't think that there's anything bad about it or that's a lower form of art. But I probably would not be doing this if you guys were not requesting it. It doesn't seem like something that I enjoy as much as I do just traditional pen and ink uh, or we're even working digitally, just working at full resolution. I think I prefer that a lot more than I do pixel art. But I figured, you know what? You guys asked. I should be game for it. So I figured, yeah, I'll give it a shot. So what are your thoughts on, on pixel art? I mean, is this something that a lot of you guys are doing in your work? 
are you guys doing video games and, and pixel art stuff? Is it something you guys find really compelling? Let's see here. Amar says, I will work out painting mechanical stuff and animals next. That, you know, in my um, in the Patreon group, I've been doing the, the art book study group. And that's where we've been going through a series of art books and just looking at different uh, different figures and creatures. By the way, right now what I'm doing is I'm just filling in this whole area now with her hair. And then I'm going with some blue pixels and give you sort of the uh, the waves in her hair. But let's see here. Um Oh, yeah. So I was talking about the art book study group on the, the Patreon. And there is so much stuff that we have to uh, to learn. I know for me, the, the point is I've been going through, we've been relying very heavily on the uh, the Joe Weatherly, um, the Weatherly Guide to Drawing Animals, because it's got a lot of beautiful both gestural and anatomical drawings in it. It's almost like he gives you both the George Bridgman blocky structures and the Andrew Loomis sort of beautiful gestural flow of, uh, of drawing animals. And I've been, been going very deeply into that book for doing studies, but there is so much in terms of the amount of time I spend doing figure drawings. I could easily spend just as much time just doing animal drawings, animal gestures, working on anatomical structures. There's a lot in there. So now I'm going through and adding um, just waves of blue to give you the sense that there's like waviness in her hair. So this is Isbaal, the, uh, the the demon queen from Morningstar. And I think that that's, oh, had a little pixel space at the top there. Let me fill that in with black. But yeah, this, I think this is pretty much all I was going to do with her. So maybe I'll do one at a slightly different resolution. I'll pick a, a different character. Um, Hyena says, your pixel art is better than mine, Jeremy. <laughs> he says, LOL. <laughs> or laughing my ass off. Pterodactyl's giving it a, you know, I don't know what the shift sign means in emoji speak. So I, I presume it's a positive, like a thumbs up. So I will, I will take it as such. Um, but yeah, I'll, I mean, in fact, I'll show you, I'll do one more pixel sketch and then we'll get back to drawing comics. But I did Isbaal here. Just her. And you know what? I really don't know if these eyes read as one eye or whether it reads as the three demonic eyes that I want her to have. So I don't necessarily know for sure, but string get down there. I think she looks more like a video game pixel character compared to what I have on my screen. So I've got that one. When I first started um, testing out pixel brushes, I was testing out canvas sizes, and this was a canvas size that was recommended by um, by the Ghost Paper, um, the book Ghost Paper YouTube channel before. So I think this is like two fifty six by um, I don't know one hundred and something. I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but this one. When I first started drawing it, I really felt like, oh, wow, this really just feels like me painting with a blockier brush. I see uh, Kino Subway in the chat. He says, hello, everyone. Never got a, I never got a chance to catch one of your live streams. I'm glad you're here now. You know, I tried to spread the word every, uh, every couple of, every two weeks and let people know beforehand when I'm going live. So I'm glad you were able to, uh, to make it, you know, make it here for this one. So just to give you a little bit of a uh, background, I'm testing out some pixel art just because it was something we talked about on the last live stream two weeks ago. So I am going to flip back to doing some comic book work, but I'm going to do one more pixel ske sketch. I'm going to do this at a larger canvas so I can show you what I see when I'm talking about it being very similar. It doesn't feel very different for me from, from regular comics work. So let me clear this layer. I always have trouble with the, uh, the three finger swipe gesture to clear a layer. There we go. And I'm going to fill the layer underneath it with that neutral gray because I feel like that's, 
I like that as a uh, a background to draw on for doing uh, pixel art. So let's see. Hyena says, I search pixel art every day. Um, damn, that's a, that's a, a I mean, because of the fact that you're studying traditional drawing and illustration, it's like, a, I feel like pixel art is its own art form. Because when I look at it, it feels almost like, like Japanese origami in that it's, as opposed to other countries, nationalities, origami. Just the, the nature of having to do very simplistic figures and simple structures, but still making it look and read and feel like um, like a piece of art, like a character that you're trying to draw. So I think for, for this one, I'm gonna draw Michael from Morningstar. Mm, nope, let's do Remiel, let's do Remiel. Um, it'll be interesting, my first female pixel art character. So let me pick a base color for her. Go into here, give us a nice rich brown. She has a little bit of a lighter skin tone. So I'm gonna orange this up a little bit. And this time we'll do it where you can actually see her, uh, her head and her arms, we'll have her gun out. So as you can see here, let me undo that. That's me just blocking in the head. And you can see how pixelated this is in comparison to uh, the stuff I normally draw. But for me, it does not feel any different than any other form of drawing. So I'm just sort of, you know what? That's still too much of her. Let me stick figure this out first. And when I say stick figure this out, this is me just sort of saying, all right, what I want the whole composition to be is here, is her upper torso. This line is gonna represent her arm. Her gun is gonna be in the hand at the end. We'll see how doing foreshortening and pixel art goes. But um, that'll be the forearm, upper arm. You drop her shoulders down a little bit so I can give her a longer neck. Her neck up there. head here. So notice I'm just using boxes to block in the figure. And then I'm gonna go in and just add and delete pixels as, or you know, draw in and erase pixels as needed. So I think that this shoulder and this arm is bulkier than I need it to be. So I'm gonna go in here and erase, whoa. Ah, I see what I did. I drew the whole thing on the wrong layer. Let's do this. Let's go back to that gray I had. This happens, folks. Drawn on the wrong layer. I could have just drawn it on the back, could have added this color in the background layer so I wouldn't change the background color so I wouldn't have this problem. But I was like, I don't know why I like having a color layer but now I am definitely on a separate layer. Let's see. Hyena says, how did everyone's crow drawing go this week? Um, you know what? The, uh, the crow videos that we were doing, those are only being shared on the, the Patreon. So I don't think anyone else that's in the regular public live stream even got to, to see that. That's really just you and a few other people. For, for those who don't know, one of the animal studies we did this past week on Patreon, so I do a, a Patreon private live stream once a month, and we do what I mentioned, the, uh, the art book study group. And the most recent thing we did was drawing crows and ravens. And because I couldn't find any art books, like none of the animal drawing books I have really cover crows or ravens. They don't really cover birds at all. So I went and I found some research online. I just found some reference, some uh, public domain photos some photos from a, a natural history museum, some from the University of Washington um, animation program where they had some, some reference where she draw throughs of the, the skull. I mean, the skeleton with a, the, the physical structure as a layover. 
overlay. That's what I meant to say. And uh, I just did what I would normally do if I were doing an illustration project, which is generally I grab my art books and look up the reference I need. But if I need to draw something that I don't have reference for, then I go online, find what I can in terms of reference, and, uh, and that's what I did there. It's like I treated it like if, as if I had a comic book I had to work on that had a crow as a main character, then I would go and if I didn't have any reference, just go find some images online, do some studies, and uh, and create I guess basically model sheets for myself so I'd have something to work from. So in terms of how everyone else's crow drawings went, that's just a matter of anyone else is in the chat who was also on the uh, the Patreon live stream, feel free to hop in there and comment as well. But I will ask you, Hyena, how have your crow studies gone since uh since you were there while we were doing them? Have you had a chance to do any uh any crow drawings? I think Alexi was on while uh, while we were doing it. So while we were drawing, so if Alexi pops in, he can can answer that. But I'm curious if you had a chance to do any crow studies. So as you can see here, I'm drawing even I'm not even drawing the arms and the lat muscles underneath. I'm doing all this in the brown that I intend to have as a Gabrielle's skin tone because it's just easier for me to block in the whole figure like this. And then I'm going to separate out just her head and then fill the rest with a different uh, color for her costume. So let's see here. Pardon me for a second. I have to... Blow my nose. Got a bit of hay fever season. Yeah, super professional live stream. Mucus and everything. <laughs> so, again, me, this is the first time I'm doing pixel art. Although it does remind me of the very first couple of times that I was learning Photoshop and not necessarily knowing what brushes to use or using the pencil tool and it coming out super jaggy. Um, but like I said, this feels like there is very little difference between this and the way that I traditionally draw. I'm not taking the time to reset my eraser to uh, the pixel brush. Let me just block in her uh, her pistol here, little Colt Navy revolver, which I still don't feel like I've mastered drawing those because the the Colt revolver has a very specific silhouette to it. It's almost like a a Porsche Carrera, like it's got this this sleek feeling to the hang to the uh, to the handle, and then before the barrel, the the part of the gun that has the uh, the chambers, it comes out with like a wedge shape to it. And it's a, it's a very sleek looking pistol. And I feel like I still have not mastered just the gesture of that silhouette. So I'm just dropping some ears on here. And now at this point, I can just fill in a bunch of these sections. And then I'll go in and clean up some of the little patchy. Whoa, that one's not filled in. Let me close that line. There we go. And now from here, I better just make the brush size a little bit larger and block this in. So let's see. Hyena said, I can nail the construction of crows, but I need to work on feather anatomy. Well, you know, I, I'll tell you that there is definitely, that's a whole area of study, looking how the feathers lay out in, um, in birds in general, in terms of how they, uh, they, they layer themselves. But I do think that it's worthwhile to also look at... Um, 
look at drawing fabric because I feel like drawing fabric and uh, and clothing that there's a lot of, or hair there's a lot of similarities between drawing hair and drawing feathers in that it has a structure but if you try to draw each individual feather you'll get lost in it and what I think is a more efficient way to look at come at it is more being able to draw the mass that the feathers make and then come in and add those individual uh, – show the individual feathers where it helps to describe the mass and describe what's going on within the, the sub-volumes, the forms within the forms. I think that coming at it from that approach as opposed to just trying to put feathers on them and put them in the right place is um, – is probably a, a good way into understanding a complex complex form. So I've got basically a silhouette here of Gabrielle, and now I can start with uh, her hat, which I'll just go with a darker brown instead of making it a black hat. Let's make it darker, but also move it into a warmer range, a little bit redder. And now I'm just doing what I normally do, which is loosely sketch in, let's say the brim of the hat is right here. Her hat, the sides come up like that and then down. That's probably out a bit too far. Let's go up and then down. She's got sort of a, a Lemmy Killmeister you know, kind of folded in cowboy hat. Let's bring this in a little bit more. I think I have it out too far, at least on this side. Out too far. I don't know if it's not down enough. Dropping down, like the, the rear part dropping down towards the base of her neck. So if her head is turned up, circle templates. I have a bunch of circle templates attached. Well, I have a bunch of rulers and templates and such tacked to the wall next to my drawing table. So, well, actually, you can kind of see them right here. You can see these guys. Yeah, there's a bunch of them hanging here. So sometimes if I get a little bit too with my hands, I'll knock them over. Let's see here. Oh, Amar's hitting up, lighting up the... the uh, the comments here, let me scroll back up. Let's see here. Amar says, I tend to just jump headfirst into everything and take my learned abilities for granted. But um, I have, <laughs> but I have not changed since taking the child's approach to everything, which is headfirst as well, without judgment or negativity. Children don't know the word no until the adult tells them. So, that, um, they learn anything and everything unbounded. You know what? I think that that is a, uh, a wonderful way to approach most uh, scenarios in life because, one, I, well, I'll tell you this. I remember when I was in college, I ran track and field. I was on an athletic scholarship. I was a hurdler. And I remember sometimes whenever we were doing new drills and watching our coach, the first time we ever did anything – he would just kind of turn us loose. And I remember once I asked him when I was watching him training a different set of athletes, because we had our, our practice where we all ran together when we were doing our, our strength building, running a quarters, 300 meter, 200 meter, like just to, to build up our strength. But, you know, the sprinters had different di drills than the hurdlers, which had different drills than, like, say, the long jump or triple jump. I remember when he was training some of the, uh, the runners on a different squad, and for some reason, I guess maybe because I was in a rest period because he would kind of stagger it sometimes so we could take a moment to catch our breath before we are going to do something really hard. I remember asking him, I'm all, you know, with the, a particular set of athletes, why are sometimes – I asked him, why is it that sometimes when you have us do stuff for the first time, you don't say anything or instruct us to do anything particularly, you just say go? And, and he said, because you might do it right the first time. Now, he doesn't know for sure, but he figures – if he gives us instruction before seeing how we do it naturally, he might screw us up, which I thought was very wise. Um, 
you know, but I guess that's how you get to be a, uh, a world renowned track and field coach is by being wise. You don't get to, you don't get that job of being a dumbass. But um, I think that to it, that relates, I guess, to uh, to what Amar is saying in the sense of just jumping in and seeing what happens. And two things could happen: a, you might get it right the first time, and b, even if you don't get it right, you may discover something new. Now, true, a lot more often than not. Hang on, I'm going to switch to a slightly lighter color now. Now, see, this is the interesting thing. In pixel art, there's also that propensity for having to work with a limited palette, a limited number of colors. And I could easily get into doing way too many colors when really, you know, maybe limiting myself to just, I guess, 64 colors, you know, a 64-bit color palette. But as I see myself drawing in here and I'm like, all right, the head, the hat, top of the hat will read better if I separate it with a lighter color of this more reddish brown. And then I'm going to cut into, not just cut into, but hang on, let me give us a little bit. So yeah, I'm just going in here and painting in what I would normally be doing if I were drawing this traditionally. <clears throat> but I am going to come in here now and add Gabrielle's hair, which is going to, her hair is black. And I'm going to have a little bit covering up, you know, between her ears and then have a bunch come behind her ear. And I tend to draw her with a lot of curls bushing out. So I'm actually gonna end up covering up, I don't wanna cover up all of that, that's her hat. Make this brush a little bit larger so I can just block in some of these quicker. But yeah, I mean, this trying out the pixel art thing, it really doesn't feel that different from the other stuff that I, I normally draw. It just feels like I'm drawing it in a, a different way. With it, no, it just feels like, I, I keep repeating myself, I'm drawing with a, a thicker brush as opposed to what I normally use. Let me go back in and paint out some of that hair and get. Now let me block in her vest and her shirt. So her vest, come down like this, down like that, down like this. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing like the, this canvas size has more pixels than the very first avatar I did, the, uh, the image of uh, Isbaal. But if you're drawing with something with the number of pixels that I'm using now, at a, a slightly larger canvas size, it's just, you know, you, you block in your figures, you block in your forms. You see, she has the, uh, the high wrist, um, the gloves, that the high sleeved gloves. So let's have those come up to here. You know what? I just realized. See, this happens sometimes. You've been drawing a comic so long, you actually forget what your, your characters look like. Um, let's see. Amar says, it does not look like this is hard for you at all. Nice work. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, um, I'll tell you, if you feel like you're having difficulties, oh wait, what is it I'm grabbing? Oh, I am grabbing an issue, 
of Morningstar. I keep a, a stack of them by my drawing table when I'm working on the book when I want to look up costume details. And for this, what I'm really just looking at is the sleeve length, not the sleeve length, but the how far up her arm, her gloves, um, her gloves go because I just don't remember off the top of my head. But what I was going to say to you, Hyena, specifically about pixel art is if you find that you're having trouble with pixel art coming out the way you want, let me just find out what the actual canvas size is for this. Canvas size. So my current canvas size is 256 pixels by 144 pixels. Um, I would just say try working at a canvas size that's not so blocky and then just try treating it instead of thinking of it as a completely different art form to just look at it like you're drawing what you would normally draw. Because that for me, it's not necessarily that this is pixel art's easy for me. It's more like I'm really just using the same mental tools I've developed for drawing the figure. I'm applying them to this blocky, um, this blocky process. So let me see here. I know Gabrielle is at the end of this issue, issue five. Yeah, so her sleeve length, I'm glad that I checked. Her sleeves do not go all the way up to, um, up her midarm, like like an Audrey Hepburn type sleeve. They actually go just up up halfway up her forearm. So they're long gloves, but they're not super long. And to be honest, I think if I had to re redesign her character, I probably would have them go all the way up to her, uh, all the way up to mid mid upper arm, like all, halfway up her bicep. So, you know, that happens sometimes. You sit here and I've been working on this comic for a better part of a decade. And now here in me working on the final issue, me doing a piece of pixel art of a character during the phase I'm working on the final issue, I'm all, huh, I should have done this with the character design. That happens. Sometimes you don't figure out the right thing to weigh later in the series. And you just got to say, wow, I wish I had figured that out sooner. And then just move on with your life. So yeah, I do wish I had figured that out sooner. Now with the rest of her vest, I am going to block that in with black. But what I do want to do, well, first off, let me erase a little bit of this. All right. But what I do want to do is come into this area and add some dark blue. You know what? Who cares? It's just uh, me screwing around here. Let's go purple. There isn't really, I never really imagined any purple in her costume. But let's go with a really dark purple and do this to add in the contours that kind of define. Nope, I want it darker than that. Let's go like this. That's close to what I want. I want something that was kind of subdued. And I just want to do this to get sort of the trim that runs down her costume. As a matter of fact, I think it probably will shove a little bit up here. Let's bring this all the way to the edge. Yeah, I'm just treating the pixel art like any other thing I would draw. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, this really, it feels like Gabrielle. Let's see here. 
Some more comments in the chat. Oh, we see Guy from Red Bank is in the chat. Hello, how you doing? Wow, it's already 11.50. I know I started the live stream late, so I'll go a little bit long. But I originally thought, oh, I'll get in here. I'll draw a quick piece of pixel art for, um, for 20 minutes and then go back to drawing Morningstar. I think that I'm pretty much going to – I'm going to do the whole live stream finishing this one piece of pixel art. So you asked for pixel art last week, you're getting pixel art. Week after that, we will um, – We'll, uh, we'll get back to, to drawing comics. But uh, you know what? There's something that I meant to ask at the top of the show, and I need to post a poll. So figure drawing. I haven't gotten dinged for showing any figure drawings on YouTube, but I have noticed that I've had some of my uh, live streams where I've tried to actually draw from photo reference. So I've got nude figure drawing models, and I'm drawing from them, not from Playboys, but specifically just books that are post books, but they've got nude models in there. And I've tried to do figure drawing from those and I've gotten bounced. Um, I've gotten my, those particular images blocked by YouTube's terms of service. So what I want to ask you guys is, would you like to see me do separate live streams on Twitch for doing like a live stream like this, but working from models or post books or, you know, the other option is I can try and find some bikinied models male and female to work from for figure drawing studies and continue to, continue to do that on youtube but if you want me to work from nude models um it seems like that isn't a problem on twitch and so i'm thinking about possibly doing a separate platform just to live stream drawing nude figure models because for me i feel like that's a very important part of my educational learning process i feel like that's helped me get to where i am in drawing comics is by doing life drawing and figure drawing and in this coronavirus era we're living in you know, I have to find other ways to work from the model. And for me, it's working from photos. And I, I kind of want to show you guys how I'm studying to kind of hopefully inspire you guys that even if you don't have a figure drawing class near you, that you can continue to study from the model. So I will at some point put a chat, put a, a poll on the, uh, the community page on this channel to ask you guys. So let me scroll back up. Um, Amar says... Uh, it reminds me of the pixel art I did in college back in uh, 89 or 90 on the Unix system. See, yeah, that's the thing. I was in college in 94, 95, and I, that's when I first started using Photoshop. I think I started on Photoshop 3 or Photoshop 4, somewhere around there. But I remember using those early versions of Photoshop, and this is what – and, of course, you're doing this with a mouse, so it takes a lot longer. And God, the saving time, the time to save. You could do a piece like this, and it would literally take you maybe five minutes to save each time you, you did it. But if you didn't save, and you go drawing for a half hour and it crashes, which, believe me, crashing happened a lot earlier back in the after, a lot more often in those days, then you were like, oh, I, I've just wasted it a half hour, 45 minutes worth of work. So uh, let's see here. Amar says, it's not that hard, it's just oversimplifying and drawing without anti-aliasing. Hyena says, the thing about pixel art is that there are very few books and recourses on pixel art, so you have to teach yourself. Well, you know, it is funny. I, I haven't, I didn't do a deep dive into process, but just in looking for this, for me to do this, I mean, I was able to, I mean, what YouTube videos? Have, have you found? Maybe there's a bunch of new YouTube videos that have popped up just in the past uh, past year because I was able to find a ton of, of videos that talked about, well, setting up your, your canvas size and your brushes. Um, in terms of technique, it looked like there was a ton on technique, but I didn't really want to go down that road only because... I did say that I was going to kind of mess around with it here with you, with you guys live and just see what happened. So whatever comes in terms of the actual process, I kind of wanted that to just happen live. Now, now her clothes, her shirt is white, but I'm looking at this white and it is so bright against the gray that I need to gray it down a little bit. It's just too bright. So it is a, a white shirt, but it's just killing me how bright this is. Let me bring this down just a little bit, a little bit off-white. So 
then she's got her not super low cut, but you know, she's got her her shirt coming down here and then back up. Let's fill that. A couple of these pic straight pixels in there. Um, yeah, I mean, when that's the thing that I really needed when I did this, and those were the, the links that I wanted to include in the chat was, what is my canvas size and what brushes do I need? And like I said, I, down, I included the link to the free brush. That was the other thing I forgot to mention, the, the Bardo brushes. She, the, her brushes, she actually has uh, several brushes for sale, but the pixel brush prep pack she had for free on her website, and all you have to do is set up for a mailing list, which this is a great, it's a great set of four brushes. So for, for the price of just signing up for the mailing list and seeing what she has to offer in her newsletter, well worth it. So, and who knows, I may learn a lot of stuff from it. That said, um, all I felt like I needed was canvas size and brushes and the, the ghost paper tutorial shows you how to create your own brushes. Other than that, everything else that I am doing here has no, has everything to do with what I know about figure drawing and it has nothing to do with pixel art as an art form. Like, oh, I'm doing something special here just to, uh, to learn pixel art. So again, I'm repeating myself, but I think if you forget about the idea of trying to make pixel art and just treat it like you're making what you would normally draw, you're just doing it with a, a big, broad butt brush, I think you might find better results. I'm trying to get her collar in here. Look at that. I can even draw her, her collar cutting down. So yeah, it's, it's all just what would I draw normally and placing those things in here. So you've got her collar, you've got her her shirt. Now all I need to do is just her face and her gun. And we're pretty much that that's pretty much the piece that, that I would oh I have to add her wings. I have I've neglected to put her wings on here as she is an, an archangel. Um, let's see what's down here in the, the comments. So we got guy from Red Bank when he popped in. Amar says there was a lot of resources, but you have to look into the gaming or art community. Um, he said, but pixel art has been around since the 70s, 60s or 70s. It was much, when it was just black and white, it was much harder. You don't even have eight or 16 bits of color to work with. And uh, Hyena says, pixel art has been around uh, around forever, but, so, but some real, but for real, let me see. But some real few people write books on pixel art. It's like, yeah, I've seen it when working on uh, learning game development. And Guy from Red Bank says, I'm um, trying to do comic books as well. Right now I'm just sketching. That's good. You know, I spend a lot of time listening to uh, live streams of other artists. I'll have them on my iPad next to my drawing table. So I feel like I'm sharing a studio with other people while I work. So that's, hopefully you guys can, can sit down and get some, some artwork done while we're, while we're sitting here sketching and talking. Um, let's see. Amar says, um, so they're out there, and I know people who do game development, and all they do is pixel art. Um, Amar recommends I would join gaming discords. And, uh, oh, guy from Red Bank says, have you tried nude models on Twitch? Yes, yeah, so that's what I was talking about earlier, was doing switching over to Twitch, not to switch the complete live stream over, but maybe start live streaming over there for when I'm working with uh, figure models. A lot of people have recommended me switching over to Twitch altogether and just uploading the replays here on YouTube, but I almost also feel like that's kind of like, I've built a little bit of a community here and I don't want to just up and ditch you guys just to be on a community that has a little bit more freedom. Um, if I started having a lot of problems with my content being banned or blocked um, on YouTube, then I probably would switch over to Twitch. But I think right now, just in terms of uh, doing figure drawing, that's something I may get into. So let's see. Hyena says all these uh, these streaming platforms are getting crazy. Guy from Red Bank is right. Check and see if uh, new models on Twitch are okay. And yes, yeah, so I, I definitely see that that's that's something that I've seen of other people doing. So I think that I might. Well, for instance, the other thing I did see was Vimeo. Vimeo, you can do whatever you want, but right now I think you have to pay to be on their platform and live stream. So who knows? I might make that a Patreon exclusive. 
that might be something where the figure drawing would be something on Patreon and I might do a Zoom call. And then it's like the people who are on Patreon can log in on that and we'll do figure drawing there and I can upload excerpts to YouTube. We'll see. Um, let's see here. You hear Beat. Um, that is all he does on his uh, for his game is pixel art, and he's done a video course on it. But most game developers, uh, since they are not artist artists, they do pixel art because it's easier to do. And uh, Heine says, uh, "You hear Beat is good. I follow his channel. He uses a sprite, but you can do it in any program." He says, "I've been doing uh, Twitch for the last six months. It's go slow going there, but I don't promote it. And it's like you can use a." Uh, you can't use nude models, but uh, you can draw. Um, you can draw them. So, see, that's the other thing I'm looking at. For me, the problem that I have, and let me keep working on uh, on this piece, otherwise I'm going to sit and just keep talking. Um, for me, I feel like it is important for you guys to not just see what I'm drawing, but to see the the reference that I'm looking at while I draw. And that's sort of what I have the problem with in um, in doing working on a platform where I am that's a little bit too dark. The problem I have in working on a platform where I'm just showing my drawings and not showing the actual reference that I'm looking looking at, is I feel like I want to show you guys the nude models, not because, oh, I want to show nudes on the internet, but because I'm drawing from an educational background, I want you guys to see the reference that I'm looking that I'm I'm looking at when I uh, when I post this stuff. So I think that maybe doing it as a zoom and recording it might have to be the uh, the solution and then uploading it to uh, to a, a separate platform but yeah because I do want it to be to be that's the challenge I want is I want to both be able to stream live so people can ask me questions like you guys are asking questions here but I also want to be able to show the new models so you guys can see how I'm translating those models you can see the direct the decisions I'm making. If I draw a line, you can look at the model and say, wait a minute, why did you do this instead of that? Why did you decide to copy the model exactly here versus make something up there? Like Those differences, those choices are very, very important. I feel like that's really how you learn. And in here in terms of the going, jumping from figure drawing back to the pixel art, I thought it was worth mentioning here that the first thing I'm doing is I'm just drawing a shadow shape. And this is really just to separate her head from her neck. Um, that alone, now that I can go in and I've got this space fairly blocked out, it seems the way the easiest way for me to conceive of this is to look at the undersides of the major forms I'm blocking in. So now I'm blocking in her nose, and her nose is a little bit upturned, so I'm going to have this go up a little bit higher and a little bit higher. But I'm just saying, all right, you've got the underside of the chin, the other side of the nose. Right there, I've blocked in a lot of details on her face. Now, let's say I just run a line up the side of the nose. And I will tell you that I do feel you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to have the room to put in as much of her eyebrows or expressions as I want. Oh, actually, yeah, I do. What this is actually very much, this is exactly my figure drawing process. It's just coming in here and putting in the, the major masses. So I'm just blocking in, you know, and Hyena, that's the other thing I think in drawing pixel art, it would be very hard for me to just put in the lines that I would normally want and just have them go where I, I want them to. But I do find it much easier by blocking in just these, these shadow shapes like this as a mass and then drawing the detailed forms inside of that. Believe it or not, even though I don't necessarily follow the Riley method, th these pieces right here feel very Riley to me in the sense that I am, I'm blocking in major shapes. Like I haven't put in a lot of detail there, but 
you know, you can see here's her her face just blocked in all in pixels. Let's see here. Oh, some more comments in the chat. Let's scroll back up. Oh yeah, Amar says you can also do Patreon exclusives on your Discord. Um, Ahida says that Discord server idea you had last week was great where we can all share artwork on there. Yes, I've been meaning to set up a Discord server specifically for my, my Patreon subscribers and have people share artwork there and I can give critiques and feedback. I do plan to set up a mentorship tier where I'm gonna actually do drawovers of people's artwork specifically on that tier and, uh, and go through and, and do corrections, give direct feedback, maybe even have it so people can log on and do that live. Um, and uh, Amar says, I use Discord and you can set up a private lessons um, with screen share in your Discord channel. So that's good. I, it's something that's been on my list to do for a very long time and I've just been so overwhelmed. I haven't had time to just do the simple setup for that. But I know it's not that complicated. I just need to get it done. Um, so, yeah, Heine is, is seconding that. He's right. You can do that on Discord. Amar says, I've done it, and you can run OBS screen capture with the live sessions and um, and calls with the Patreon exclusive users. So uh, Zeus Tovez, that's my buddy Jesse. He's here, and he says, uh, and by the way, thanks for dropping in. Good to see you. He says, hey, would a regular website help at all hosting something there? Well, I feel like if I had my own hosted website, um, I mean, it's for me, I would still need the technology. It's more about the streaming technology and the uh, the content. So if I had my own website, I would still need to have streaming a streaming platform that would be plugged into. So I don't know if having a regular hosting website would, would change the platform that I'm streaming on. It's more of a platform where I can live stream but show – new figures and that really moves away from from youtube and uh, and twitch and that's moving into zoom and skype so it might be that the uh, the figure drawing stuff will become private content and maybe i can upload clips of that onto uh, to youtube and then have the the regular content i so yeah having a whole separate website for that that doesn't necessarily benefit me i think one way or the other um, I do know a lot of people have talked about having, um, hang on, I'm going to draw Gabrielle's eyebrows in here. So you make sure that my brush is as small as possible and then just try and lightly, I want, I like her eyebrows to arch a little bit more. So let's have them arch off of the, um, and let's have them cut down a little bit. She's a little bit pissed off. See, I can get some expression in the pixel art. Um, and now let's get her eyelashes down here. You know what? I think that this might work easier if I draw in the whites of her eyes and then do the, uh, the eyelashes over that. And again, the pure white is too much, so I'm going to do that slightly gray. But, um, but yeah, and I've – on this topic of having a separate website, I have heard of a lot of people talking about, you know, not that I think I would get deplatformed or I'm doing any really inappropriate content. I don't think I'm doing anything that's crazier than what other people are doing on Patreon. But they talk about the idea of – having your own separate website set up just in case you never know when a platform will go away and you'll lose all those subscribers you have to that and that it is wise to have to consider building your own separate website not to get away from patreon but that if you needed to you could go and, and have build your own uh audience member site so that is something to keep in mind now, I will tell you that drawing eyes are difficult in pixel art. Unless I were drawing a very, very large portrait. But there we go. Yeah, look at that. That looks like Gabrielle. Let's give her 
a little bit of darker lip color. on her upper lip. And I'm gonna use this to also draw in her nostrils. Darker color on her upper lip, dot nostril, dot nostril. Oop, want this to be more horizontal. Her nostrils, and let's put this under her, uh, no, that's too dark. So look like she's got a goatee. We're not going to put anything on her. We're not going to draw that little under the lip area. But what I am going to do is I'm going to now grab her skin color. And I'm going to go a shade lighter for a little bit of gloss. That's too much. There we go. Look at that, guys. It's Gabrielle. It's pixel art. I'm pretty happy with this. I really am surprised at how well this is actually coming out, considering it being my first pixel art piece. Um, it is. It's. I'm glad you guys recommended doing the experiment. I'm really gonna. I'm gonna throw her wings on and her gun. Um, probably on for another. Uh, 15, 20 minutes. So, I mean, I started like about 10 minutes late, so we'll go a little bit farther. Um, but let's see here. Amar says, it's better to do it on a server that is built for a... Uh, oh, in terms of the, the live stream, Amar says it's better to do it talking to uh, to, to, uh, to Jesse, to, to Zeus. We'll just keep referring to Zeus so people in the chat will know who that I'm talking about. Um... But he says it's better to do it on a server built for that. You have to have streaming media server to do live streams on your website. You can only store recorded video, but even then it would be counterproductive. Um, you can have open channels and private channels. And uh, Hyena says, how much it will, um, is the mentor tier, how much will it be a month? And I am thinking I have to look at what other people are doing. Somewhere between somewhere between $10 a month and $15 a month. Um, but I'm, it's also going to be capped in the sense that I'm probably only going to be able to do drawovers for maybe three pieces a month per person. And what we'll probably do is we'll have a private, instead of doing the art book study group, we'll replace that with an hour of me taking everybody that's in the group. And I'm going to cap it at like five people for starters. And so in one hour, We'll have five people's pieces, and I'll take anywhere from one to three drawings of each of those people and do drawovers. And during that drawover, hopefully people will be on live so they can ask me questions while we're doing it. And I can just make corrections and notes. But even if someone's in a different time zone and can't watch it, you know, the replay will be there. And people will be able to ask questions both on Discord and comments on the actual Patreon page. The point is that if, you know, I'm going to keep it to a low number of people at the start and see how many I can do. And if there's a large demand for it, if all five of those tiers fill up really quickly, then I may look at doing, doing it twice a month and then opening up an additional tier. And that additional tier will probably be more expensive. So what it'll be is the first of the people that will come in will come in at one tier at a what I think is a pretty low price. But I'll keep it, you know, the, keep it capped at a low number of people. And if more people want in, then I'll probably price it closer to what I think a mentorship probably would be, which is somewhere between 30 and $50 a month, depending on who you're studying with. And that again, will still be capped because I only have time to do so many drawers in a given day. Um, I mean, if it ends up being where, Oh, I've got a bunch of people that just want to study with me full time. Then I may just make it where I might switch it to weekly and if I've got enough people subscribed to the mentorship, it might just be something where hell, that's what I do is I just do drawovers for people and give them feedback and I can afford to do it, do that on a weekly basis as a Patreon tier. I don't know yet how it's going to go. This is all reaching out into, into actually teaching formally, as opposed to just sharing my process with you guys. It's kind of a new thing. Like I'm very glad that everyone gets a lot out of this channel. I want to build it educational. I've always framed this as 
me sharing my learning process as opposed to it being formal tutorials. So becoming a full-on teacher, it's going to be an adventure for all of us. I'm going to learn with you guys. There'll be places where I'll stumble and fall. There'll be places where hopefully I will fly like an eagle. So you guys are going to get to learn with me. Um, let me run through and catch up on the comments so I can get, you know, I can can keep drawing and wrap up Gabrielle here. But, uh, but Amar just says, uh, if you need help, just let me know. It's always better to host video on uh, video streaming services. And yeah, that's what I was thinking is sticking with some sort of platform for that. So if I'm doing private stuff, I'll probably just record it myself. Um, and the streaming, I'll probably stick to YouTube and Twitch. So let's see. John Nussick says, what up to Jesse? You know, they all, we have a, a group that we call Coffee and Comics. We get together. It's coffee with a K and comics with a K. Look them up on YouTube. Vince Moore, who has definitely shown up on uh, chats in the past, he's the one who coordinates and organizes the group. Um, so go ahead and, and yeah, definitely check that out on Facebook. In fact, I'll put another, I'll put a link to that in the uh, description as well, so you guys can check that out if you want to check out the Coffee and Comics uh, Facebook group. Um, and uh, and hyena saying what's up to uh, to to John Ursick. Um, Amar says, I finally post my comic on Webtoons. I've been sitting on it since uh, December um, since December or February. I'm going to go check that out. I'll go to your page. I'm sure that the link will be on your your face on your YouTube channel. I'm going to go over there and check that out. So um, I look forward to seeing it. You guys should go over to, his, to Amar's channel too. Uh, click on his uh, his icon in the description and that in the in the chat. And that will take you to his uh, his. YouTube channel. And from there, I'm sure there will be contact information for finding his comic on Webtoons. Uh, <laughs> Guy from Rib Bank says that for the artwork, it looks like the DOS edition. And uh, and Amar says, I need to fix the size for the, uh, the the other images and upload them. He said, Discord is really better for me because it's an enclosed community based on the people you invite or people that are fans you respect in your community. And uh, and Ursic says, gray shadows for the uh, the folds on the sleeves would really make it pop. He's a master of color. Very good point. Um, I'm going to go in there right now, and I'm going to add that. I'm going to start with gray for the underside. And once I get the underside, I'm going to try and pull the, uh, the folds for the sleeves out of that. And let me see if this 10% darker. Yeah, let's start with that. So what I'm going to do is dis define... First, the underside. So that's going out to her elbow. And that's going out. To her upper arm, to the, the pec muscles going into the shoulder. So I'm even describing her anatomy with the uh, with the folds of the clothes. Whoops, that's let me undo that. Okay. I think that the color drop. I would have to mess with the threshold since I'm doing a color drop over two shades of gray. So it's probably easier for me to just fill it in like this as opposed to dicking around with those threshold settings. So I think the threshold settings I would use for different colors is, are not the same as the thresholds I would do for just filling in gray. So now from here, I can say some folds on that part of the sleeve. And let's put a little bit of folds in the shirt there. Let's see here. Oh, one of my cats, Felicia, is coming onto the art table. Whenever she sees me drawing, she's like, what's going on over here? Piglet? My art director, always fussy, checking with what I'm doing. Yeah, so for me, drawing the uh, the folds, I'll come back to the comments in a minute. Um, I mean, I always try to think about the folds in terms of anatomy. So when I'm drawing them in there, 
for me, it's not just a matter of adding wrinkles, it's defining what's facing the light and how can these folds help define different forms. If I that little chunk there to help define the shoulder, again, making it pop. That was a good call, John. Thank you so much. Helps a lot when you've got a comp book professionals looking over your work um, as, you're, as you're working. You can chime in and say, hey, man, you might have you thought about doing this? Sometimes I think about volumes just in terms of trapping light. Like I just try to figure out what is the surface that's facing the light and then sort of encircling it. Like this shoulder right here, I'm just thinking, all right, here is a, a surface that's going to have light in it. And let me go in with a little bit of gray and paint out. You know, that's a good question. Do I really want to paint this out or do I want to connect this? Eh, I think I'm being too fussy, particularly for pixel art. What do you guys think? I still have to do the wings and this. I'm not going to draw all of her fingers, but I'm going to draw her gun in and the wings. That's the, the last part I'm going to do on this. Um, let me get back to the chat. Oh, but Amar was talking about a uh, enclosed community based on people you invite or people that are, are fans fans or people uh or people you respect into your community you know i i feel like i have been very very fortunate <laughs> oh <laughs> let's see um i've been very fortunate on that just in the sense that most of the people that have come to my channel have been really really respectful and i feel like i've built a community here on youtube just by talking to people have people that have been watching me over years and, and come by and finally they've been watching for years to start participating in the chat, actually talking and beginning a, a dialogue and a discourse. Um, I mean, there's a lot of people, when you look at some of the more famous people that are YouTubers per se and they have large platforms with millions of subscribers, then you get a lot more of trolls, and people coming in just to disrupt it or say horrible things or to be, um, to be hateful and, and attack people. And I feel like I've been very blessed, but I think part of that's also the fact that we haven't gone over 10,000 subscribers yet. We're still at like, we're not even at 7,000 subscribers yet. We're at 6,000 and change, which yes, I do want the channel to grow and get as large as possible. But I think that part of the intimacy that we have, and the reason why I've been able to just be open and, and talk with you guys like that is, um, is the fact that it's been a small community. So that is gonna be a, a larger issue as things get bigger. But what will happen is I think the people that we have the kind of intimacy and chat we have with will probably also migrate over to Patreon and onto other platforms as opposed to, and you know, then maybe this will be more of a, a broadcast only channel where I may answer some comments, but I may not be able to talk with everybody. But we haven't reached that point yet. So there's no point in worrying about it. it we'll, when we get there, we'll burn that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> A little comments between uh, John and uh, and Zeus talking about uh, just touching base. And um, Hyena says, $10 to $15 a month, you work cheap and I like it. Well, like I said, the, the first thing, the first um, mentorship uh, tier will probably, again, I was starting with, with probably thinking closer to 20, but it's going to be, like I said, anywhere between 10 and 15. But it's going to be really just to see how many people want to get in and have a one-to-one -one mentorship program um, in terms of me reviewing their art. And plus, two things. Clar let me clarify. What that mentorship will give is me actually doing drawovers of one to three drawings per month. That's not a ton of interaction compared to people that have 
full-time, you know, that have, they're, that are full-time teachers that are doing mentor programs. Um, so I don't also don't want to make it like I'm giving away the farm. So it's, it's just a step up from the comments that we have now and the, the interaction we have now. Um, for anything more than that, it probably will be a more expensive tier. But again, very few people and just doing some drawovers. So um, <laughs> the, the guys, Jesse and, uh, and Zeus are just talking about catching up with our Coffee and Comics group in the chat. So let's see. Um, Amar says, I only have a page on there, but I will plan to post more today. We're going back to his webtoons. Um, so the plans for everything to get better. Um, John says, woot, looking good. Um, Amar says, especially the new uh, sketch paints he's working on. And Amar says, yes, this would be easier to am animate. Um, more comments from uh, from Zeus about our, our Coffee and Comics, uh, a, a digital Zoom version. So we're, we're probably going to do that online. And uh, Amar says, um, do use as a Discord or, or a Twitch icon. So I think I will save her for that. And, uh, oh, yes, John also says some, uh, some gray under the collar. Let me get back to that uh, the darker gray I was using. You know what? I honestly, John, you could save a lot of artists' pain if you could if if by having a colorist on with them while they're drawing, and then just be able to say, "Hey, man, how do you plan for that to be rendered? What do you want this to look like?" You could save so many artists so much time and pain, not just in like an artist doing color pieces. But artists penciling and inking, because I know a lot of times, I feel like drawing color pieces makes me a better penciler and inker. Because there's a lot of decisions I make in the uh, the drawing phase that do not complement color, and it would behoove me to have a better sense of what I plan to do in the to have a better sense of a color plan for a piece while I'm working. And I mean, I think that's one of the advantages that comes with working with a complex editor and working in mainstream comics is that you have someone who can look over it ahead of time and see those mistakes and say, not necessarily mistakes, but just see that you are not thinking about, when I say you, I mean me, that an artist is not thinking all the way through about what the final art is gonna look like. That there will be places where, oh, in the final art, you're probably gonna want to leave this open line so the colorist has a place to really shine and bring a lot of value to like a large color field. And then in places where an editor might say, hey, in this area, you're probably gonna wanna black that out because there's no need to draw attention to it and a large dominant black might make the make it pop compositionally. So those are, are two different areas that, you know, I've, I was actually writing for, again, for my, uh, my Patreon, I write blog posts throughout, and one of the things I was thinking about is that, now that needs to be darker. It's too much of a, uh, too much like the background gray. What? Okay, I see what I'm doing here. It is picking these colors instead of me, um, what I want is to pick the colors from my, my sampling as opposed to it doing what it's doing here, which is I was changing the colors of my swatches as opposed to picking new colors. And I really wanted to pick a color from my swatch instead. But I was thinking about the fact that um, when artists work in mainstream comics, they frequently are forced to develop what's called their deadline style, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a style that is simple, less detailed than they normally have, but it doesn't look crappy. And you know, the purpose of having a deadline style is you're on deadline, this comic book needs to go to the printer, and you don't have time to dick around. So a lot of artists will develop that style that it might not be the work that their their fans love, but they'll still look at it and not necessarily have a noticeable difference 
in terms of what they've uh they've cut out and changed you know it's it's basically a, all of the shortcuts an artist uses in order to to stay on deadline and because i self-publish i put up my books when i want to and i put them out when i feel like they're ready and what i was thinking about in uh a blog post that i wrote for future posting is how in a certain way being an indie artist I have not, I've done myself a disservice by not developing a deadline style. Um, and that's mainly because I haven't been forced to. For me, it's like if I am behind on a comic, I just take my time and make it the best that I can. And I think that artists should always strive to make their books the best that they can. But because I've been so focused on the learning phase and continuing to grow and improve my craft, I have, I did go through a period where I was just like, I'm going to try and draw each issue as quickly as I can. And I was not happy with how those issues came out. There were like two issues, two and issues three of Morningstar. If you notice any additional, if those two issues look rougher than other issues I've drawn, that's the reason why. It's because I was trying to develop a deadline style. And I was really not happy with how those came out. And consequently, I went back and I slowed down on uh, future issues. But I have continued to maintain that slowed down look. And I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, it takes me a very long time to finish each issue. And I wish that I did draw comics in a faster clip. I wish I could do a monthly comic, even if I'm working for myself as opposed to working for, uh, for Marvel or DC. So just talking about the editorial eye and having somebody to look over your work reminded me of the fact that even though I am not actively you know, seeking full-time work at Marvel or DC, there's a lot to be learned from that, that work environment and creating comics at that pace with such very challenging demands on you. So let's see. Guy from Red Bank says, sorry, I'm, I'm busy drawing. Hey, I'm glad you're busy drawing. That's what I want. Everyone hanging out and uh, and, and drawing, you know, working on stuff while we're, we're talking. It's, it's cool. That's what we're here for. Um, John says, John Ersick says, you learn a ton by coloring other people's bad artwork. You start seeing a ton of missed opportunities. Ah, see, that's interesting. Um, but uh, he says, but yeah, but Jeremy says about seeing your artwork differently when you um, – Think about color. Um, Zeus says, question for John on coloring. How much of an artist's inks do you alter for better color effects? And he says, LOL, depends on the um, on the project. Generally, the inks never change. Amar says, you can do it if you break up the comic into smaller chunks. When you uh, say, I'm going to do two to four pages a month. Um. Yeah, yeah, I think that breaking anything into smaller ta smaller tasks tasks helps working through all those difficult um, challenges. But I think for me what I'm thinking about is more of just the the general I'm trying to think of a way to phrase it. Well, I guess just really it's what I said before about developing a deadline style having that thing where you're working at a pace that's much faster than you feel comfortable working. It's, I'm talking literally about the pace at which you produce work, not, oh, you're doing a smaller issue or you're doing a smaller workload. I've never been forced to do the heavy workload that a monthly comic artist does. And that's because I've always said, well, I'm still learning. I, um, I'm gonna work at the pace I want to because I'm not working for a major publisher. But I think that there is a lot to be learned and gained by creating work at that very high pace, that very high demand. I just don't know if I would necessarily be happy with it. And being that I've got a day job, I don't have the hours to put into it. Actually, I think that's part of what had me thinking about it too, is the number of hours that if I've got a day job, then it would behoove me to be a faster artist, to be able to finish like even if I can't do, you know, 20 pages a month, to be able to do, okay, my comics are 24 pages. Each issue is 24 pages. If I could say, all right, I'm fast enough to do maybe 12 pages a month, 
finished, penciled, inked, lettered, then that still means I could do a bi-monthly comic as opposed to a monthly comic. So I'm talking specifically about, regardless of how many issues you publish, I'm talking about the speed, the pace at which you finish comics. And right now, my pace is very slow. And part of that is me trying to learn with every issue and, and grow. But I think part of it is also that to a certain degree, I do baby myself and give myself that time to, to do things as opposed to saying, oh, I've got to get this out. And I want to see what happens if I do a comic where I'm just, I'm working not at a monthly pace, but I'm intentionally drawing at a speed of, oh, I've got to get this out. Like I've got to get an issue out every other month instead of monthly. I mean, hell, I'll tell you, whoa, why is this getting so small? Um, I'll tell you, Terry Moore, I'm sure he's busting his ass. His comics are bi-monthly, and I'm sure that doing a bi-monthly schedule is probably killing him. So let me color drop in here. So I decided, I was trying to debate on what I was going to do for the, uh, the wings, and I decided to go with the full bright white as opposed to going darker. So the wings are even brighter than her, uh, her clothing, which in real reality, you know, if you look at birds and how dirty their wings are, I mean, I'm thinking mostly of seagulls, but if you look at birds, you see that more often than not, their wings are not white. The clothes, the clothing would probably be brighter or whiter than the, um, the feathers. But for this piece, I've decided to do the reverse. So we are almost done here. I'm gonna just go in and draw in some feathers towards the bottom and we're gonna call this piece a wrap. So let's see here. Amar says, oh, in terms of doing a two to four pages a month, he said, then you'll be able to get out chapters instead of a full book a month. He says, the faster you can, uh, the faster you get, the more you can get out. He says, take the agile approach, as they say at my job. And then John says, you'll probably never be able to do it with Morningstar. You're going to have to let yourself work on someone else's project to really be able to develop the deadline style you talk about. And it's like, yeah, you're, you're right because you need to be able to put all of your time towards that. And a lot of times, I, I feel like a lot of times that deadline style also, yeah, you've sped up, but you're also putting in, you know, what, 12? I mean, John, you tell me. My understanding is that most comic book artists, professional artists, are usually working 10 to 12 hour days, most days. People working in mainstream books. Um, there are a few people that can get stuff done in an eight hour workday, but you know, 10 to 12 hour workdays, my understanding are the norm. And then there's, you know, those deadline days where you pull in, you know, hopefully the longer you work in a career, the less you have to pull all nighters, but that there's still definitely those times when you're putting in 14, 20 hour days. Let's see here. Draw in some feathers. Let's try it like this. See, this is the other thing. Back in the 80s, you couldn't just flip your, uh, your monitor around to get a better angle. One of the uh, the big advantages in the di making art in the digital age. more feathers up here. Mm. 
even in pixel art, flats come in handy. So I'm sitting here doing this, I'm thinking if I were, if I had bothered to make a selection beforehand, I could have just masked out, not masked out, but blocked off the rest of the, uh, the figure. So I wouldn't be worried about drawing over her arm. Yeah, guys, so my first piece of pixel art here, I don't think that, again, it's not something that I necessarily see myself returning to because I don't really do video games and indie games. But that said, as far as pixel art goes, I think for a first shot, it's pretty good. All right. So, again, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate everybody that, uh, that showed up, had comments in the chat. Um, John and Jesse, thank you guys both for, uh, for coming out and, uh, and hanging out with me. Um, thanks, Amar. Thanks, Hyena. And again, thank you for being a, a supporter and subscriber on Patreon. And for the rest of you guys out there, again, if you think that the stuff we've been talking about in terms of seeing me doing figure drawing work and working from models, if that's interesting to you, possibly getting on my uh, mentorship tier, I'm going to make it a priority to get that tier set up in the next uh, couple of weeks. I, I plan to do that. Um, so, you know, all of that will be available on my Patreon. That's patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. Um, on the newsletter, you can sign up for my newsletter, get the best of my posts on social media from the month, uh, newsletter.jeremy.net. Also, that's where I announce new artwork. When I have new art and prints and comics for sale, you know, you can get all of that on my newsletter. And if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my books, read it digitally on Amazon Kindle or Comicsology, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. Um, final comments on the chat. Uh, Red Guy from Red Bank says, take care. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, uh, let me swap back out to me. And um, Amar says, can it be animated? It did turn out well. Um, they do have animation features in Procreate. I'm not going to dabble in that because I got comps to make. I got time to learn how to do animation and procreate, even if it's very simple. Um, so that'll be there for, for another time. Guys, thank you so much. That's it for now. Go be creative. <laughs>